Welcome to Startup Hacks, a We Global podcast. We explore the stories and secret strategies that women entrepreneurs use to save time and money when bootstrapping and building their businesses. I'm your host, Fernanda Carapina, and today I'm excited to welcome Joanna Bloor. Joanna is a professional adventurer and startup junkie. She spent most of her career scaling brands such as Ticketmaster, Open Table, and Pandora. Then life threw a new adventure in her path, one that reminded her that every decision made about you and your opportunities is made in a room you're not in. This both brilliant and painful experience had Joanna choose to pivot and start a new adventure. Joanna, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Well, we are delighted to have you, and I know our listeners are in for a treat. So I wanted to start the show, if you don't mind, I'm sure you've done this a million times, um, but I really wanted you to share a little bit about your just personal background growing up, where you grew up, how you got started in this kind of work, or not this kind of work, but your corporate work back then. Absolutely. Accidentally, isn't that always the answer for everybody? Um, <laughs> Luck, skill, timing, and an eye for opportunity all linked together. Yeah, so I'll start out with, especially as I just said the word start, and I'm sure people are like, wait, what? She's not <laughs> from America. Um, no, I was, uh, I was actually born and raised in the southern part of the UK. Um, and just to kind of paint a picture for people, went to a school that I now describe as like Hogwarts without boys or magic, um, which meant I had a very, well, a fairly strict, weirdly Victorian childhood with all sorts of societal rules and regulations and expectations and all of that sort of stuff. And then through uh, a very long story that, well, I will not get into, um, I ended up emigrating to Texas as a 15 year old. And just to give the listeners the opposite version, the school I went to there was basically Friday night lights come to life. Really? And yeah. Oh, could, could not have been like, imagine every stereotype of both of those works of fiction. And they were both completely true. Um, and I thought the whole thing was a, one big surprise after another um, and be absolutely hilariously funny. I was like, oh, my God, like America <laughs> and Texas and cheerleaders and football and the whole thing was really fantastic. But, you know, I tell that story and why I think it's so important for me is um, I did shift from a world where I absolutely believed that my future was kind of mapped out for me. I I had examples of people around me, um, and it's not that everybody did the same thing, but, uh, you know, my parents had a conversation with my teachers when I was in, gosh, I think the equivalent of U.S. sixth grade, where they said I should study commercial art. Um, mm. And they have those sorts of conversations, and there's it's a very different education system and how you go through, but there was, you know, I... I think if I had stayed, I would have probably ended up becoming a teacher, maybe an, even an art teacher. Um, I'm, you know, who knows, right? right. Um, and when I moved to Texas, because of, again, a number of different elements to it, what I realized very quickly, other than, hang on a second, this is a very different game here, is that all of the rules that I had been told, other than the don't be a jerk and don't you know, don't be a jerk to yourself or somebody else. And then generally don't do illegal things. That's a bad idea. Um, especially as my, my stepfather at the time said that if they catch you doing something illegal, they'll deport you back to the UK. And I had, I decided very quickly I wanted to stay in the U S. <laughs> um, but I realized that all of the rules were kind of up for questioning and my attitude of, well, who says, and not in an, in an, a mean way or a, a an aggressive way, but I always just sort of look at things and go, well, what, hang on, who said that's the way you're supposed to do it? Um, and especially switching from an all girls school in the UK to mixed in the US and while completely blown away by the freedom to choose my future that was allowed to me in the US and especially the bonus points of, you know, 
we think you're awesome because you sound funny, which I was like, wait a second, <laughs> what? Um, I also was really shocked by comments. Like I remember in a chemistry class, somebody putting their hand up, you know, I putting my hand up at a question. I thought, you know, this is what you do in class. And one of the girls um, coming up to me afterwards and said, you know, you, you should be careful about how often you put your hand up because the boys won't want to go out with you. And I was like, are you kidding me? Um, and so, you know, my fiery independent, I will, it's okay to be, I got, I was given permission to be very different and saw the benefit of being different at a fairly young age and got the opportunity to, to break the rules. And because, you know, I'm old and er ergo, there was no internet back then. I also really learned the quite painful lesson of how important relationships are and how, if you want to be connected to somebody, it's your job. And if they decide they want to make an effort to connect back to you, then bonus, but you should never expect somebody to actually make the effort. But if you are willing to make the effort to stay connected to somebody, then relationships are these beautiful, magical things that, that last over time, which is why, you know, I'm still friends with a girl I was with, I was basically pen pals with since we've been about seven years old. Um, mm. And I, you know, I, again, I tell that story because when you sit here and say, well, Joanna, what was your career? How did you get to here? How is it you managed to, through what looks like really lucky guessing, which to a certain extent it was, got to go through four different IPOs with different startups. Wow. It was always driven and it didn't matter what I was doing. You know, I'm a certified travel agent. I used to run a very fancy bathing suit store once upon a time in my past. And so know more about the construction and product iteration of swimwear than a normal person should all the way through to, you know, I helped and I do apologize ahead of time. I helped write the industry standard terms and conditions for online advertising, the very first version of it back in 2001. But all of that was driven by a couple of things. And one of them was, I am always interested when people and groups of people are saying, well, hang on a second, who says it needs to be this way? And could it be a different way? Um, I am always interested when they're doing that in a way that what I call more than provides value, but provides delight, really just makes somebody go, whoa, whoa, this is a different way of thinking. Um, and is always a collaborative experience is with other people going along the way. And that's always been, well, I don't think I could have articulated it quite that succinctly. In my past, that was always a driver for why I would choose to go work for what was City Search originally back in 1995, which was one of the very, very first kind of web companies um, to, that brought me to the Bay Area when I came here for Open Table. And, you know, I think Open Table at the time had maybe 50 employees um, mm -hmm. all the way through to Pandora and and all of the jobs in between. You know, I was with um, Cena, which then got acquired by CBS Interactive. And I had dozens of different jobs there because even within a really big, complex, political, massive corporation like CBS, there are pockets of what I call, you know, dabbling on the edges of how things should be done and innovation. And I believe that that has only sped up and continues to speed up. Um, and so, you know, when I talk to anybody who stands still long enough and will let me listen to me, I say, you know, what new technology on the horizon is interesting is interesting to you that is something that makes you delighted and go learn about that and go plan that because it's been it's been the driving force for my entire career. Uh, and then you mentioned in the opening um, that I learned a, a brilliant and painful lesson all at the same time, which I think is how lessons often come to you. Sometimes yes. you, don't rec you don't recognize the brilliant sometimes until after the fact. Mm -hmm. um, and the, you know, I had made the decision that the itch to scratch of becoming my own boss, building my own delightful thing, absolutely goaded along the founder of Pandora, who is one of the most delightful human beings on the planet, Tim Westergren, who I would work with again in a heartbeat 
on my last day, pulled me aside and grabbed uh, and said, let's grab a coffee. And he sat down and he goes, well, so what company are you going to build? And I was like, wait, what do you, what do you mean? What company am I going to build? And he goes, well, Joanna, you've been building other people's companies for 10 years. You know how to do it. It's time you did yours. And I was like, I can't do that. And he was like, yes, you can. You are the biggest rule breaker out there. Go do it. Um, and so I blame him a tiny bit for making me actually go, oh, is it time? But it's uh, the entrepreneurial itch is one that I have wanted to scratch since I was little. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so then went out looking for the thing that delighted me, what I thought was fundamentally different from anything else I was hearing and meant that I got to play with people in the process. And, you know, five years later, here I am. Wow, that's an incredible journey. And I know that you've been so um, so fortunate to work at a lot of these wonderful companies that, you know, started with an idea and then just hit it out of the park, which doesn't happen all the time when you work at a startup. Perhaps you work at one that really is successful, but to, to work at four is really an incredible uh, learning experience. So I, I'm wondering when you did leave and you started um, your your work as an entrepreneur and kind of went down your own path. Were there, um, were there, you know, some specific goals? Was there a why that you were trying to answer at the time or were you just kind of trying to figure it out as, as you went? Uh, a bit of both. I think I would put, uh, 50 50 in both of those pockets of there was a specific goal and I was paying attention only because I do in almost everything I do I ha I hold contrary ideas in one hand um and the having a specific goal and not having a specific goal is one of those as an example mm -hmm. um you know I think that the specific goal was I was going to give myself permission in essence for, and I gave myself a period of time to do this in, I'm going to give myself permission to explore the idea of being an entrepreneur for a specific period of time, because, you know, I had come from, and I think this is, this is so common for people in general, especially a little bit later in life. You know, I had been, I had been on somebody else's payroll my entire career. Now I still think you have to, learn how to deliver value and help people understand your value, even when you're an employee of somebody else, but you know, health insurance and all of that other stuff was somebody else's problem. I didn't have to think about that sort of thing. And so I was absolutely terrified um, and not entirely sure that I could do anything, but I also knew because I had um, a group of people that I surrounded myself with who were who played very different roles for me and roles like um one of them plays very much the role of mirror to me you'll notice that i don't call any of the people around me mentors because i think it's been overused and it talks about too many things and i think you have to be specific the same way you need different advisors when you're building a company right. but i had a mirror and i think you know mirrors are these unbelievably magical people who are completely egoless in their feedback um, and are only actively ambitious for you, but they also can give you the, well, when you say or do this or say or talk about this, is I, this idea, this is what it sounds like to me. And is this what you mean it to sound like? Um, cause often as, and I, you know, I work with a lot of entrepreneurs now, I work with a lot of people with all sorts of brilliant ideas. And often the idea is so fully baked in your head. Um, like I think about movie producers as an example, like they have, well, not even producers, directors, they almost have a vision in their head of what it could look like. Mm -hmm. And the, the hard part is articulating and creating that vision through to other people and making mm -hmm. sure that your vision is actually aligned with your audience is, is quite difficult. It's actually, that's actually the hard part. Having the beautiful imagery in your head well, isn't easy, easy, but it's certainly easier. Um, so I have mirrors around me. I also um, have uh, what I call potentialists around me. I call myself a potentialist, by the way. But potentialists are people who are fans of how you think more than what you do. Mm -hmm. And um, because they are fans of how you think, 
they are always genuinely curious about what work product you are working on because they're always like, well, what is the result of that work product? Mm -hmm. Because they don't assume that a thing needs to be a thing, which again is very egoless. Like they don't go, oh, well, this is what it should be. Um, But potentialists look at something and go, oh, this is what it could be. Um, And when you do that on a very human level, these are people who understand your unique set of skills and your unique possibilities and again are actively ambitious for you and are like well you know is whatever it is you're talking about actually leveraging your unique set of skills um and there and then last but not least um i had sponsors around me and i don't mean the financial sponsors i mean the people who were like you know what you have delivered value whatever value might be over time and earned not only my trust in making a bet on you, but also the trust in my relationships. And so would open doors for me and say, look, you know, so-and-so you need to talk to Joanna because she's a really good idea. And by the way, you should write her a check as well. Um, And really would absolutely do that actively. Um, And sponsors are really, really interesting people because often They don't announce themselves. They don't say, hi, here's who I am. Um, And especially, uh, and I talk about gender a little bit, especially as women, this is something we generally do a lot of um, because of a myriad of reasons. But the guys certainly do it for each other. And I was like, "Mm, how do I make that happen? Um, So surrounded myself with these folks who, as I was saying, "I, I want to start a thing from an idea that comes from me in a very selfish way. And I think, again, I hold, I love to hold two contrary ideas in my hand. It's starting a company is a very selfish thing to do. And yet it's probably the most generous act you will ever do in your life if you are doing it right. Because if you're not generous about it, it's not going to work. Right. Um, And so holding those two things, my sponsors would come back and actually say, look, you know, my, my mirrors and potentialists would help me see if my idea was understandable, my sponsors would actually help me see if my idea was marketable because there was always revenue behind it. And that, you know, when I come back to lessons learned at multiple startups is revenue is oxygen. Revenue is a thing that allows you to move forward and really thinking, you know, who who and why is somebody going to buy something Um, and the actual value of a dollar as you are thinking about that, I think it's critically important. And often I hear really beautiful ideas and I'm like, yeah, but you know what, who is not, who is going to pay for it, but what is the market that is going to pay for those sorts of things? Right. Um, And it it applies not only to ideas in, in, for companies, but I think it also applies to ideas for individuals. Like I heard a, I was working with, uh, a young man the other day who wanted to pitch a job to his boss. And he was like, I want like, help me figure out how to pitch this new job to the boss. And I said, does the job exist today? And he said, no. And I said, well, then you don't want to push the job to the boss yet. I said, you've got to back up and actually get the boss to agree that the problem that the job is going to solve actually exists. And that there is a financial driver that actually can connect to that. And I said, now, once you get that, once they go, ooh, if we invest into this problem to help solve it, then you can create the job, but don't be coming in and saying, look, I need a job because I need the, the sticker and all of those sorts of things. So Joanna, I want to, I want to ask you um, in the last few minutes that we have on the show, if you would share, given all that you've done, both on the corporate side and also as an entrepreneur and with the hundreds of people that you've worked and consulted with on their path, what are your three kind of go-to um, hacks that save you a lot of time, have saved you money, and even, you know, provided a competitive edge for you? Sure. Well, I'm sorry, Fernanda, but I am going to push back, is I think we live in a world of cheat codes, and they do not yeah. serve us. We need to actually look at power-ups, um, because what power-ups do is give you tools to actually do the work more. And And I'm just going to share a little data point with the audience to prove my point, because I got one the other day and I love a data point, is um, they've been studying the value of homework with students and noticed that in there's a dramatic drop in the value of homework 
from 85% impact on a student's grade to a 45% impact on a student's grade because the shift has gone from to be able to, to do your homework in the early 2000s, you didn't really have the internet to go look up the answer. Today you do. And because the answers are generally copy and paste, mm -hmm. um, they are not actually understanding the material. And actually the, the research and understanding the material means they are better students at the end of the day. And I, mm -hmm. I say that and say, this is actually kind of power up number one. Um, I'm just gonna use my language instead of yours, is that you know we are all both experts and students of everything. Uh, and yeah. figuring out for you both what are you an expert in? So can people figure out how to engage you in your area of expertise, but also where are you a student? And being a student of something means you can also be a complete and utter train wreck in it as well, which I think is bonus because you can't actually be right about everything. This whole, uh, you need to have all the answers and you need to be perfect is just right. And so I tell people a lot, I am a student of whatever it is, which still gives you the points for being smart about something. So that's the first thing. Uh, and actually figuring out what you want to be a student of, I think is critically important. Um, the second thing uh, that is a drumbeat for me is, is there a smarter, easier, faster, more fun way of doing everything? Um, I have almost an allergic reaction now only because I've had to be a, in essence an inventor most of my life anyway. But if, somebody says, oh, well, this is the way you do something. I almost like a little kid with a train set will take the entire thing apart and look at all of the parts and go, well, is this the most efficient way of doing it? Is this the most fun way of doing it for me? And is this, can I put it back together in a way that not only is efficient and fun, but also is more fun for the other side and actually reinvents how something is done. And um, initially that's a lot more hard work I think when you do it over and over and over again, certainly the way I did it in, in my career so far, I've gotten very fast at it. It's a bit like any skill that you practice over time, um, that you get very good at it over time. And that's um, not necessarily following the rule book for everybody else is, is a biggie, as you heard from the beginning. And then um, the last one, which seems so simple and yet is so important, is belief in oneself. Um, you cannot expect or ask anybody else to believe in you if you do not believe in you. And confidence is a muscle that you build over time. And the only way to get more confident in something is to do the thing. There is no hack for confidence. There is no, no here are the things you literally do it. And I, you know, I joke with people that my, you know, we're all locked in houses in COVID at the moment. And so my husband has seen more of me than he normally would. And every day I come to dinner and I tell him how I am a genius in some way, shape or form. The other night I was a no code genius. I am teaching myself how to use um, API calls and um, yeah. different cloud-based systems to build whatever it is I want to build. And so I've been walking around telling him I'm no code genius and he laughs at me, <laughs> but it really, the conversation is with myself more than anybody else. Cause I need to believe it first. Well, I think you're you're a hundred percent right about the confidence being critical to success a hundred percent. Well, unfortunately, Joanna, we're out of time. I, I feel like we could go for it easily another half hour, but maybe we'll have you back sometime very soon. So thank you for being on Startup Hacks today. Your insights were incredibly insightful and I'm sure our listeners really enjoyed hearing your journey and your point of view, which is always incredibly inspiring and very original. So if anyone would like to learn more about you and your work, where would you suggest that they go to find out more information? Sure. Best place is on the website at joannablore.com. And I'm sure you're going to put links in and spell out my weird sounding name, which is where you can also find me on both Twitter mostly and LinkedIn. So at Joanna Bloor, J-O-A-N-N-A-B-L-O-O-R are the best places to find me. 
Perfect. Well, thank you again. And tune in next week for more Startup Hacks. We have another great show you won't want to miss on the secret female founder strategies that can save you time and money when building your business. This podcast is brought to you by Women Entrepreneurs Global, the first startup studio and digital do-it-yourself startup platform for women. For more information on our guests, this podcast, and many other female founder programs, please visit womenentrepreneurs.global. I'm your host, Fernanda Carapina. See you next week.